breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Good morning. Very good. I'm very electric. Just talk quietly amongst yourself. How's that? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. All good. Okay, keep that passage open in front of you, friends. Good morning. My name's James. Uh, great to see you. Um, an accusation is sometimes levelled against men in this church, and I want to give you an opportunity to uh, turn that around. Uh, people sometimes say that men here don't are not in touch with their feelings, and uh, I think it's very unfair and unkind. And so what I want you to do is have a look at the passage this morning and assume for the moment that there are feelings in the world and assume that for a moment there are two feelings, happiness and sadness, okay? Are you with me so far? What I want you to do is have a look at that, through that passage just with the people sitting around you and discuss is this a happy passage or is this a sad passage? I don't think I can make it much more complicated than that. Uh, so is this a happy passage or is this a sad passage? I'll give you a minute and then we'll... Vote or something, I think. Okay, I, I normally don't do ministry by democracy, okay, but just for, for the sake of today we will. Is this a happy passage, hands up? Is this a sad passage? Okay, we'll see how we go, we'll see how we go. It's hard to work out, isn't it? And I'd be interested to hear your conversations. Um, one of the, uh, why don't I pray and then we'll get into it, how about that? Uh, Father, we do thank you that we can come uh, to the Gospel of John this morning. We pray that you would help us to see what you want us to see, to respond to Jesus how you would long for us to respond, to find great life in him. Amen. Uh, Karen and I go to a bunch of weddings these days. People at night church just seem to get married all the time. And uh, one of the things they do now is they're very much more organised than when we got married 100 years ago. When we got married, there weren't things like wedding registries and that kind of thing. So what, we, what happened for us is we ended up with 14 trays. Now, I'm not ungrateful, generally, but I felt like 14 trays was probably more than we could cope with. And uh, that's the time in which I can remember receiving a gift and kind of rejecting it. I'm not sure what the case is for you, whether you received a gift and rejected it. I think what we see here in John chapter 5 is something like that. Jesus comes with this life, uh, the life that we saw prophesied in Isaiah 35, and yet people reject him. Two people, it would say, or two groups of people at least. You've got this long term invalid, and then the Jewish leaders. Because you kind of start reading through this. In, uh, in John 5 and think, ah, oh, it's another healing story, great, people are going to be excited, people are going to love Jesus, that's great. That's not actually what happens at all, is it? It's quite surprising the way it comes out. It's different to what we expect. We expect celebration. We expect people to go, Jesus, life, hooray! But I think it's a sad story. First the man who was healed and then the Jewish leaders. Let's have a look. First of all then, Jesus is rejected by the healed man. Uh, have a look there. Verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. Uh, before we get into it, just notice how many details there are here. Uh, John wants us to 
get the details. This is not just some fable. This is not some interesting old wives' tale. This is a historical event, something that happened to real people in real time. Uh, Christians are not Christians because they've got some weird blind faith. We believe this because it's true. It's based in evidence, often eyewitness evidence. There's archaeological discoveries that have kind of uncovered this particular pool as well. You can go and visit it if you want to. So Jesus comes to this pool where there's a multitude of invalids. It's kind of the first century version of uh, Prince of Wales Hospital. Probably what would have happened is that family members would have brought them here at the beginning of the day on the way to work. And they would hang out there and as we see, there's a kind of clear intention. They go there because they want to get well. They go there, uh, if you look at the bottom of your Bibles, there's a kind of verse 4 that's not really included in the old manuscript, so it's there at the footnote, uh, which gives us the kind of background information. People went there because of some legend that if you made it into this pool after it was first stirred, you'd be healed. That's why they went. That was a great hope of going to this pool. It's famous. And so a multitude turn up. Uh, we have the same thing today. Uh, the town of Lourdes in France. There's famous religious spring water where people flock to in their millions. And so along comes Jesus to this multitude of invalids. And he picks out one man. One man among possibly hundreds of people. A man who'd been unable to walk for how long? 38 years. That's a long time. 38 years ago, I was a snotty year 10 boy at Warrawee Public School. 38 years ago, it was 1984. Those of us alive were watching the Los Angeles Olympics. Apple Max started selling in 1984. Medicare came into Australia. And most significantly at all, of all, a jar of Vegemite became the first product in Australia to be electronically scanned at a checkout. It's important. 38 years he had been an invalid. The same routine every day. The same disappointment every day as someone else gets into the pool first. But this what day would be different. This day his life would change forever. With a word from Jesus, everything changes. Not because he made it to the water first, but because Jesus looked at him and said, get up, take your mat and walk. Verse 9, and at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. What do you expect to happen next? Presumably, the guy say, wow, Jesus, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You've changed my life. Doesn't happen though, does it? In fact, if we were reading through this carefully, we should have been prepared for some kind of sting in the tail. Look back at verse 6. Jesus asks a really strange question. Do you want to be healed? <laughs> Sounds like a stupid question. Like imagine you know, seeing a doctor doing their rounds at St. Vincent's, coming to someone. Do you want to be healed? What am I doing here? John's signaling a problem. We're not sure what it is. We're kind of scratching our heads to try and work out why does Jesus ask a question like this? And see, maybe this man is kind of inexorably linked to his condition. Some people, sadly, are so attached to a tragedy or event or something that's gone wrong in their life that they're unable to detach from that particular thing. A missed opportunity, a sickness, a crisis, a tragedy, something. And so we can tell ourselves a story that keeps us in this state of being a victim and powerless and pass passive and pessimistic. Maybe this man's problem is his inability to see himself as anything other than this kind of long-term condition of being an invalid. 
Maybe he's just so caught up on getting to the waters first that he can't see any other option. Jesus wants to grab his attention and say, I can heal you. Look at me. Trust me. Leave behind that silly superstition with the pool. I can heal you and I will heal you. It's a remarkable miracle. There's about 40 doctors in the room. They will tell you what a miracle this is, that someone who hasn't moved for 38 years, suddenly all their muscles and tendons and bones and everything else are suddenly able to move and and he can walk. It's a miracle upon miracles. But here's the thing. John doesn't write this so that we go, ooh, ah, what a great miracle. John's concern for us is that we see this as a sign. A sign of something bigger, a sign of something better. Uh, We deal with signs all the time. You dealt with them on your way here. Uh, You saw these lights as you came to church. Red is a sign for stop. Green is a sign for go. Orange is a sign for drive faster. That, like, we uh, kind of know what signs mean. We saw the sign, a symbol of that sign in Isaiah 35. A world where the blind would see and the lame would skip through the hills like deers. That was the dream. Here is the reality. The lame do walk when Jesus turns up. Jesus gives life. Here is the one who gives life and life to the full. But as I said, I think this is a sad story. This man who's healed just doesn't get it. Look at verse 14. Jesus finds the man at the temple and he says another strange thing, a thing we don't expect Jesus to say. Verse 14, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. (laughs) No pleasant greetings. How's life going for you? Has anything changed? No. It's a really stern warning. This is not meek and mild Jesus. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. They're ominous words, aren't they? That is, there's a worse result than 38 years of being an invalid. 38 years of being unable to move. There's something worse than physical pain. Jesus is very clearly saying to this man, I've restored your physical life. But if you ignore the spiritual realities of life, so much worse awaits you. Here's an opportunity to reconsider, to think on what's happened to you. Of course, Jews at the time assumed that if someone was sick, then it was a result of their sin. As we come to John 9 in a few weeks, we'll see that Jesus breaks the kind of necessary connection between sickness and sin. But here's the thing here. Just because sin is not necessarily connected to sickness, it it doesn't mean it needs to be. Just because there isn't a necessary connection between sickness and sin... There can be. Sickness can result from sin. When bad things happen, it makes sense to ask, what should I consider? Is there a lesson to learn? So Jesus is saying to this man who's healed, reconsider, think again. Not just that you might get sick again, But how much worse is an eternity in hell? And yet look at the very next thing that happens. Sin no more. What does he do? Verse 15. The man reports Jesus to the Jews. He dobs on him. (laughs) The Jews had given him a hard time and so it's time for him now to give someone else a hard time. 
to turn the attention away from himself and onto Jesus so that they would know, these Jewish leaders, who to blame. Why does John include this sad, sad man in this sad, sad story? I don't think it's complicated, but it's not easy. Not everyone responds to Jesus positively. Even people who know the life that Jesus brings, even they can be the most ungrateful fools. People who should know far, far better can reject Jesus for the silliest of reasons. There's a strong warning here. The saddest person on earth, and frankly the person in the scariest position on earth, is the person who knows the grace of God, who knows Jesus, who knows what Jesus has done but rejects it. To reject the only one who can give you life is the craziest thing you could ever do. But as I said, it's not the only sad thing that happens here. Point two, Jesus is rejected again this time by the Jewish leaders. It's one thing for Jesus to be rejected by the man he's just healed. It's another to be rejected and persecuted for restoring life. It kicks off uh, back in verse 9, and we read those words, now that day was the Sabbath. And if you've been reading your, your Bibles for a while, you'll know that's kind of code for, oh no, things are going to go bad. particularly here in John 5 to 10. At both the beginning of this section, John 5, and then when we come to John 9, both these miracles happen on the Sabbath and both of them attract conflict. Jesus has just healed a man who's been an invalid for 38 years, a man who was utterly dependent on his family and friends, utterly hopeless and helpless, utterly broken. And what's the very first thing the Jewish leaders say to him? Hooray! Great news! No, verse 10, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. (laughs) Can you imagine a sadder thing to say to a guy who has been unable to move for 38 years, is now walking around? It's the Sabbath. Don't carry a mat. Jesus has shown incredible kindness and these religious leaders say, you shouldn't be doing this. They can't be happy, they can't rejoice. They just throw the book at him. Well, not really the book because it's not what the Bible says. Sure, the Sabbath is an important law, it's there in Exodus 20, you can read it. But what these religious leaders have done is they built this whole system of rules around what the Sabbath actually meant. What the Sabbath was meant to do was to help you trust God. Take a break from work and spend a day trusting that God would look after the fields and spend time remembering Him. But by the first century, the Jewish leaders had come up with all these rules and bylaws and everything else that meant you couldn't carry your mat even if you'd been healed by Jesus after 38 years. And so as we've seen, the man turns the attention away from him and onto Jesus and the Jewish leaders, it would seem, are happier to go after the bigger fish and so they go and persecute him for healing on the Sabbath. I imagine they had guessed that the person who'd done this was Jesus. And so when this was confirmed in verse 14, they go after Jesus. Why doesn't Jesus defend himself? I mean, he could quite easily have called out the religious leaders for their nonsensical rules. He could have pointed out how good the intention of the Sabbath was. And how it was completely legitimate to do good within the Old Testament law. Why didn't he do that? Well, he had a bigger purpose. 
healing on the Sabbath, as we'll see, was a minor crime compared to what he's about to confess. Look down there, verse 17. Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. That's a mic drop moment, if ever there was one. It's so outrageous what he's just said. That God the Father was working was uncontroversial for these Jewish leaders. That they believed in God, they believed that God was working. What gets Jesus into trouble trouble here is his claim to be equal with God. What's hinted at in verse 17 is made super clear in verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The tension between Jesus and these religious leaders has now reached fever pitch. Jesus is now public enemy number one. Why? Let me, let me uh, ask you to imagine a you know, Hollywood courtroom drama. You've got the criminal in the dock being cross-examined by the prosecutor. I think Jane Pangolingham, uh, she's prosecuting away. Uh, I won't use an American accent because she doesn't have one. Um, <laughs> you can imagine what she's saying. You were there, weren't you? You stole this man's watch, didn't you? But then the man in the dock says something surprising. Your Honour, I didn't do it. I couldn't have done it. Because I was across town robbing the bank of $400 billion. I couldn't have done this minor crime. This minor crime is an irrelevance. I was actually doing something far, far worse. That's the sort of thing that Jesus is doing here. He takes their accusation about healing on the Sabbath and adds a much more serious charge. Working with the Father as an equal with the Father. He's jumped from the proverbial frying pan into the fire. This claim completely does the Jewish leaders in. It's utter blasphemy. It must be punished by death. Again, why why does Jesus do this? Why does he engage at this level? He, He knew full well that it would kind of intensify the conflict. Until now, he'd had a fairly low or lowish profile kind of turning water into wine at a kind of country wedding that was fun, uncontroversial in some ways. Even at the beginning of this chapter, he heals the man and then withdraws so that no one kind of, he doesn't draw attention to himself. But now, the conflict has escalated. He's engaging deliberately with these Jewish leaders. And it ends up getting him killed. The rest of chapter 5 is a reflection on this claim that Jesus is equal with the Father and working with him. So next week we're going to spend a fair bit of time thinking about that. Why is that so important? Why is that so significant? Next week. For now, let me ask a question about Jesus and you. That is, this claim, this claim of Jesus to be the Son of God makes him someone we just can't ignore. The man healed by Jesus at the pool of Bethesda ignored Jesus to his eternal peril. The most dangerous thing in the world is to hear the life that Jesus offers and reject it. If Jesus is equal with God the Father, if Jesus is working with his Father to bring life, He can no longer be just another religious character. Jesus can't be another good teacher, a wise guy with good morals. This claim that he is God himself come to earth, working with his Father to bring life, to rescue people from hell, to restore a new world order, to bring the new Sabbath, to secure eternal rest for God's people...
We just can't refuse a man like that. It's utter folly to refuse this gift. The wise response, the right response, is to respond with thanks and praise and worship. To live lives reminding each other of how good Jesus is. As Joe said already, today is kind of like our kickoff Sunday for church, and it's exciting for lots of reasons. It was great to commission the leaders to see them in their shirts. Growth groups will be up and running soon. But here's the thing if we're just a church that runs programs, we know better than any other community group. If all we're doing is signing up to more activities, uh, filling our diaries with more events, places to be and people to see, we're not helping our kids, we're not helping ourselves, we're not helping anyone else. The question from John 5 is this, what will we do this year to ensure that we don't reject the Lord Jesus? What will we put in place to ensure that we don't refuse Jesus. It might be, be after a, a crazy couple of years, a longish summer, that we think, oh, I, I just need to get my personal Bible reading back on track. It might be that we decide to sign up for a growth group for the first time in years. It might be that we look for opportunities to serve at church as we kind of come back together again. What will we do to make sure that we won't neglect the great life that Jesus has come to bring? I'm going to pray in a moment. What I'm going to do is uh, go old school and jump back into this uh, a, a Puritan prayer from this book, Valley of Vision. Uh, it's a complicated prayer in terms of its language, but I think you'll find the prayer lines up brilliantly with John 5. So it will be on the screen if you can cope with praying with your eyes open. If you'd rather pray with your eyes shut, feel free to do that. Friends, let's pray. O oh God, thou injured, neglected, provoked benefactor, when I think upon thy greatness and thy goodness, I'm ashamed at my insensibility. I blush to lift up my face, for I have foolishly erred. Shall I go on neglecting thee, when every one of thy rational creatures should love thee and take every care to please thee? I confess that thou hast not been in all my thoughts, that the knowledge of thyself as the end of my being has been strangely overlooked, that I've never seriously considered my heart need. But although my mind is perplexed and divided, my nature perverse, yet my secret disposition still desires thee, let me not delay to come to thee. Break the fatal enchantment that binds my evil affections. And bring me to a happy mind that rests in thee. For thou hast made me and canst not forget me. Let thy spirit teach me the vital lessons of Christ. For I am slow to learn. And hear thou my broken cries.